Hello there, everybody, uh, in person on online. I just want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Vincent Lau. Vincent uh, is a superb clinician and uh, high-powered researcher with uh, previous fellowship in ultrasound to boot, so he's a bit of a powerhouse, a trifecta powerhouse, if you will. And uh, he's going to give us this talk today. One of his areas of expertise is the use of TE in critically ill patients, and so I think this talk really jives well and kind of speaks to that. So I'll let Vince take it away. Thanks, Vince. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, hey to everybody online and to everybody in the room. Um, as mentioned before, this talk is going to be on TE and its utility even in uh, settings whereby the user might be using it primarily for basic echo, but it will be the best set of images and the best set of interpretation that you'll have anyways. So I have some disclosures. I have some grants that uh, actually funded some of the TE program stuff here. Uh, we were able to get some probes, three extra probes here at the U, uh, one probe at the Alec, one probe at the Nuns, and we're hoping to get, I believe, another probe at the Mids eventually, and then uh, something at the Sturgeon. Uh, but one of my biases, so again, I come from the research world, so I'm not supposed to have any biases when it comes to data and uh, you know research. But in terms of clinical uh, buy-in, as well as kind of um, looking after patients, I believe that ultrasound will actually make you a better clinician. It'll improve patient care because you'll get more timely information at the bedside as opposed to waiting till Monday or Tuesday after a long weekend. You can look after patients at, you know, in the evening or on the weekends as, uh, as well or even better than you would um, otherwise if they um, if they came in at those times and you're waiting for a formal echo or formal ultrasound of some some sort I'm not paid by any ultrasound companies I don't sit on any any ultrasound boards and I don't own any stocks and shares in ultrasound companies but I do believe that poker should be democratized to all this whole thing about it being kind of like only rolled out to certain subspecialties like radiology and cardiology I don't think that's right because what ends up happening is now you made the system more important than the actual patient that's in front of you so for those who are actually willing to train for it, it's just like anything else in medicine, it's all scalable skills. And you can use that particular tool to diagnose various things. And we'll come up with some, you know, uh, we'll go over some other examples of other uh, technologies within medicine that is actually scalable. And it's not just one particular subspecialty that overreads this particular entity. It's everybody can do it, but, you know, obviously different subspecialties will have different, uh, you know, um, expertise or you know different skills at uh, being able to do that so for example um you know brian and i myself and then a whole bunch of our other colleagues in pocus have actually uh, uh educated people in ed anesthesia i am critical care but also other subspecialties for example like i have a particular interest in uh, transcranial doppler so we've actually uh, educated neurocritical care uh, fellowship uh, um, clinicians either from neurology or from critical care Endocrinologists actually look at th thyroid. The urologists have been looking at some of our videos in regards to like um, uh, hydronephrosis. And obviously the vascular guys uh, have a look at uh, some of the vessels in terms of, especially like a triple A AAA or something like that. So just wanted to thank uh, a lot of the people who've actually been uh, pioneers and champions in this particular area, uh, specifically our um, uh, Brian and my uh, mentor back in uh, London, Ontario is our Rob Arnfield but also Scott Millington in Ottawa, Yannick Bellieu in uh, Montreal, Drew Thompson, Frank Mislick are in Emerge at, uh, in London, Alberta Goffey is in Toronto, Haley Hobbs is at Queens, John Besmaggi is in Toronto, uh, sorry, is in uh, Western, and then Warren Luxon and Al Salford Bish are actually here. There's also some pioneers in uh, the US as well as internationally. So Paul Mayo is probably the grandfather of uh, critical care ultrasound. And he's brought a lot of kind of the guidelines as well as some of the position statements for the ACCP at, uh, in chess. As well as Seth Koenig, Neelam Sani, Brett Nelson, Vicky Noble. These are all like uh, chairs colleagues of ours, and Sam Brown. Philip Turan is actually coming, I believe, this yep. year in sure. August to yep. do the TE um, uh, session as part of the West uh, C CCUS West or CRUS West uh, course. So we're looking forward to that. And then a special thanks to Arbor Le uh, Lebovitz. So he's a cardiologist and intensivist, but he's cardiologist by training. He used to be the National Board of Echo past president. And he sits on the committee for the CCX exam. He's the one who actually started championing and pioneering the ND exam for critical care physicians. And he's a cardiologist to start out with. So the fact that a cardiologist felt that it was important that intensivists or other critical care physicians or uh, people in resuscitative echo have these kind of skills and have an exam for which we can get, uh, you know, Brian and I are actually uh, testimers as well as uh, uh, diplomats of that particular exam. So, you know, that's it's important to know that even other subspecialists who 
this used to belong to, or, you know, quote unquote, uh, feel that it's important that other people have that kind of, you know, that democratization as mentioned before. And then the inter international team. So Daniel Lechtenstein, if those of you who know uh, who, he is the grandfather of, I guess, lung ultrasound. And then Antoine, uh, Antoine Vira Baron and uh, Philippe Vignon are um, uh, uh, French intensivists as well, who, who champion a lot of uh, TE as well. And then Paul Young is actually a collaborator of Rob's, but also of uh, Sean Bagshaw is actually from New Zealand, who also uh, has an interest in, in ultrasound. So the, um, for those of you who are old like me, uh, who know about Indiana Jones, there's a new movie supposed to come out. Uh, this is a clip from the very first one. Hopefully the audio will play online. I'm not sure if it will, but hopefully it will. So Harrison Ford, when he looked a lot younger, maybe Han Solo times. All right. So the reason why I showed this clip is that imagine that guy with the big sword is your resuscitative, you know, the scenario somebody's arrested or whatever. And Indiana Jones is not messing around. He brings out a gun to basically take care of the guy because the guy obviously has some skills with his with his sword. Uh, the idea around this is that uh, remember that in a high fidelity situation whereby somebody's like basically arrested and dying, and you're kind of futzing around with a trans uh, thoracic probe, like a phased array probe, you really can't get up near the chest anyways for a personal long axis or your apical views. You can really only get access kind of in the subcostal views. And keep in mind that while CPR is ongoing, it might be very difficult for you to even get views because there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening at the chest. You might actually get pushed away and you can only really do this during pulse checks. And so part of uh, what we want to kind of like adopt or like, uh, you know, uh, encourage actually during uh, resuscitative scenarios like this is that T is actually something that can be rolled out. And even if you're not doing all the fancy stuff about figuring out RVSP and, you know, wall thickness and things like that, you can still gather good information and remember that an autopsy can never tell you what the LV function was at the time of the arrest, right? Like only uh, like an autopsy can tell you how heavy the heart was, how thick the chambers were, how much atherosclerosis was, but it doesn't tell you what the function of the heart was. So, um, you know, imagine we're the kind of like the millennial generation, we take photos of everything, put it on Instagram and stuff like that. Yet we don't gather, you know, a resuscitative echoes at the time of arrest, right? Like that just seems a little odd, like, especially when, you know, a lot of the things that we make decisions on the H's and T's and arrest and, you know, VT and VF, we need to know that information in order to deliver the shock or deliver the thing that we're, you know, trying to fix, right? So also, I can just add, Vince, like, you know, for a long time, like in the, op in the operative uh, scenario kind of context, yeah. you know, if you arrested in an OR, there's a extremely high chance you're getting a TV, yeah. right? And that's in an OR. And so for a long time, looking at ICU, and still in a lot of places, you still have a TV. And it's just interesting the kind of sense of urgency and sense of utility of the device itself and of the technology. But it really does offer a lot of patients that are crashing, and, you know, a lot of people in the room. And so if there's just a, not a lot of space and you need answers, it can really offer a lot. Yeah, you can't go to CT scan at that time, right? When you're on like open on the OR table, like, but you need yeah. to know whether or not, yeah, like, the long bone fracture patient does have a PE now, or they've had a fat embolus that got sent or whatever, right? So like, there's lots of things that you can gather in the same setting, uh, especially when you can't transport the patient or like they've arrested and you need to find out answers very quickly. So POCUS is uh, a mentality of escalation of appropriate set of techniques, even using a quote unquote, like a T advanced tool to even perform basic echo uh, but ramp up uh, based on, you know, the advanced uh, characteristics of that particular patient or getting the diagnosis if you have some more advanced skills to be able to get further diagnosis. But again, TE can be rolled out uh, and you can still do basic uh, POCUS with it. So the classic thing that we teach at the CRS, uh, uh, CRS uh, West course or the, 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 the main course back in London is that we're looking at LV function, RV function, RV size, pericardial fusion, uh, IVC and major left side regurgitation. So putting a color box over your aortic valve and your uh, mitral valve and looking for, you know, evidence of severe uh, MRAI. Again, like the moderate stuff and the mild stuff is, you know, important to know uh, for all, all of us who, who write the echo boards. But for, you know, uh, for even the basic trainee, the idea is that if you can identify severe, you can at least get them to the OR, get them, you know, the right, uh, you know, uh, consultations of cardiology, cardiac surgery or whatever, right? 
So 90% of all the main diagnoses for POCUS actually come from basic POCUS. So all the stuff that I just mentioned there will get you most of the things that you need to intervene on right away. The extra 10% of diagnoses, um, um, I wouldn't say 10%, actually, it would probably be a little bit more than that, especially with adult congenital and things like that. But a lot of the other stuff requires a bit more work. So it requires usually a fellowship or some uh, time, uh, you know, uh, on ultrasound rotations and things like that uh, to learn some of the more uh, nuanced things with spectral Doppler and stenosis and things like that. But uh, again, most of the stuff you can gather for, especially in the resuscitative echo uh, kind of realm, is done with just basic focus. So we have a consortium across Canada called the Canadian Critical Care Ultrasound Consortium, for which Brian and I are members. And it was started by Rob Arnfeld and a whole bunch of other the people that I mentioned before on the, on the other slide. And one of the uh, kind of like mantras that we have there is that T uh, within uh, critical care ultrasound is an emblem of contemporary, so in the moment, high acuity focus with philosophy for maximal efficiency, bedside confidence and uh, timeliness of answers. So whether that's actually gathered by transthoracic or transesophageal, you can gather all these uh, things and that uh, this one skill set uh, lends itself to another, right? So for example, if we get well-trained in transthoracic echo, just remember that the images are flipped in TE, but the interpretation is the same, right? The LV functions, uh, you know, like the uh, same way we look at it, the way that we, you know, uh, assess for AI and MR and things like that is the same. So in plain English, what we're basically trying to say is that the best tool for the job is used at the time when, especially in high fidelity, especially in arrestive situations, is that, you know, uh, there's no time to waste, basically. You can futz around with TE, uh, but you can have a lot more confidence in TE. It'll probably be, even for the very novice TE user, you plop the probe down right into your metasophageal uh, four-chamber view. It'd probably be the best four-chamber you'll ever acquire, right? Like, even if you have no skills just for showing up, just for putting the probe down, you might get some of the best images you ever get. Remember that it's fast and furious. It can have timely answers quicker, uh, and it's actually quicker and easier to learn than transthoracic echo. That being said, most of uh, most of us within the TE world say that you need to have a very good basis, especially with some of the more advanced techniques like spectral Doppler, in order to uh, roll out to TE. But in fact, when you do TE, and we'll talk about some of the acquisition stuff a little bit later, uh, it's actually easier to learn because there's less degrees of freedom, right? If you think about a phase array probe, uh, kind of sitting on the chest, you have like 360 degrees or 180 degrees of circumduction. The nice thing about the TE probe is that you can basically put it in, put it out, turn right, turn right, turn left, and then adjust the omniplane angle, right? And the omniplane angle is a button that uh, sits on the TE probe. So there's a lot less degrees of freedom, but because all these um, images are actually acquired in a very standard fashion at the same kind of like level in terms of omniplane, that you can basically get good at it and you'll probably be more, re more reproducible doing T than you would uh, transthoracic. And then the final thing I'd say is that uh, th it doesn't get in the way. So T is less disrupt disruptive to resuscitation. You can plop it into the esophagus. You can have it just basically hanging in the background while you're doing the resuscitation at the same time, as opposed to the really only the subcostal long axis is the only thing that we can get from transthoracic uh, during a resuscitative scenario. And, it's, and, and even at those times, it's going to be hard because again, like patients, uh, patients are getting CPR, uh, the image quality might not be as good because you're kind of phasing in and out of plane and things like that. So, um, you know, T uh, can get to continuous basically monitoring in that setting. So we wanted to demystify TE. Uh, prior thinking was that basic echo was uh, only uh, doable with uh, transthoracic echo, but advanced POCUS was both transthoracic and doing spectral Doppler as well as TE. However, TE is just a tool to gain better information. So similar to bronchoscopy, so like, for example, at, as an ICU physician, I know how to do bronchoscopy, but I know how to do some of the basic stuff with bronchoscopy. So I know how to do a BAL, I know how to do basic biopsies and things like that. If somebody asked me to do a transbronchial biopsy looking at a lymph node that had cancer in it at station seven or something, I wouldn't be able to do that. That'd be the belonging of respirology. But it doesn't mean that bronchoscopists are only respirologists, right? Same thing with vitreal uh, laryngoscopy. So ICU, ED anesthesia, lots of other specialties use uh, you know, a uh, uh, glide scope, but it doesn't mean it belongs to any one particular uh, uh, subspecialty. And EKG, the same thing. So cardio would actually get mad at us if we were like, oh, you need to come to, we need to consult you for every 15 lead ECG that we do, right? Like Emerge does that all the time when they're doing, you know, uh, you know, right-sided leads or back-sided leads still looking for posterior MI. They would get annoyed if they had to look at absolutely every single one. Now, doesn't mean that they don't get to bill for that particular, you know, like they'll look at the 15 lead and they'll bill for it, but they won't get like every single console for every single 15 lead. So again, 
scalability for a lot of these things is actually uh, like it's important because again um, for a lot of the people who are first starting out they're like well I can't use TE because I don't know any of the spectral Doppler stuff but in an arrest scenario you're not going to use like like doing uh, let's say for example diastolic dysfunction is not going to be the reason why that patient arrested. You're going to use it for major things like LB function, RB function, pericardial effusion, major left-sided lesions and things like that. So again, it's to scale, uh, scalable. We want to disrupt that paradigm and have a shift in people's minds that T can be used for both basic and advanced. And you can look for some of like, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner here, you'll see that hemodynamics, devices, aorta, endocarditis, cardiac sources, embolism is kind of the more advanced stuff that we use for critical care echo and TE, but the basic stuff uh, is all uh, fair game as well. Because again, we still have to report on those things when we uh, when we do these TEs. I just want to comment how amazing it is, like how far it come from for like bronchoscopy, for example, and dialysis. Yeah. Right? And you, you talk to centers around the world and you're like, oh, it's intensive to do bronchoscopy and dialysis. And there's yeah. this look of like, what? Yeah, exactly. How is that so, possible? Yeah. We're one-stop shop. We do everything. So, yeah. Um, so one of the uh, detractors is that, well, generally that if people don't do a lot of tea and they don't have a fellowship in it, generally means that um, the diagnostic accuracy is going to be lower for critical care physicians compared to uh, uh, cardiologists. Well, that's actually not true. So we actually did a study back in London and we looked at a retrospective analysis uh, looking at all the tr uh, critical care echoes that were done. And within a 72 hour period, whether or not a cardiology transthoracic echo or TE was done afterwards. And they, as you can see there, there was high sensitivity and specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, as well as di uh, diagnostic accuracy in the range of for the primary diagnosis in the 90 to 100 percent. And for other major diagnoses, so incidental diagnoses of 80 to, uh, to 100 percent. So that was the range. So again, we do this. We do it fairly well. And keep in mind that so a lot of the uh, TEs that were compared to for critical care were actually done to transthoracic echoes, 50, uh, 51 out of the 56. Keep in mind that the reason why the uh, sensitivity and specificities might have been a little bit lower is actually the true diagnosis was actually made by the critical care echo, not the cardiology one, because the cardiology one, again, only picks up, you know, 70 to 80 to 90 percent of all diagnoses. There's a lot of things, for example, like incidental finding of a, a left atrial thrombus that would never be found on transthoracic echo, right? It was only found on the cardiology, uh, car, uh, sorry, the critical care TE. So again, like some of these numbers are artificially down because these more superior modality actually found the thing and the thing that was compared to the gold standard was actually more inferior, right? So uh, we have some guidance states from the uh, from this consortium. So we say in terms of the gravity of illness um, and disease calls for tools and philosophies that are equally matched in reliability and precision. The sicker the patient and the higher the acuity, the higher likelihood of needing the best, the fastest, and the best tool, tool possible. For those of you who, uh, who've ever spent time in an echo lab, know that 20% of all images are poor or of like, you know, in uninterpretable quality. And I would say that because in the echo lab, you, you're able to roll people to left lateral decubitus or get like, you know, uh, the patient in the right position, that in the ICU, it's probably even less, probably a third of our images or maybe even more are un un uninterpretable. So why not use T in, you know, the highest value, highest quality, even for the basic views, especially in the sickest patients that we have in the unit, right? So POCUS TE, the nice thing about it is it's indwelling and can be, so this is kind of in the resuscitative uh, scenario, but it can be used in the non-arrested you know, arrested patient as well. It can be indwelling and continuous, does not disrupt CPR. It can actually, uh, you know, augment CPR. I know Brian's talked a lot about, you know, uh, hand positioning in terms of, well, if the patient's getting CPR and you notice that the uh, left ventricular outflow tract is actually being uh, compressed, that probably the hands need to move down so that you're, you know, compressing more of the LV. So therefore the LVOT is actually open and you're actually ejecting properly, right? Uh, you can still defibrillate while the TE probe is in situ. There's less user dependence, and I mentioned this before. So again, transthoracic echo, because you can move it all around in 180, 360 degrees, you have unlimited angles. And so therefore, when you have unlimited angles, you have more room for error in terms of you know, uh, you know, acquiring the best image. In T, you can only insert, retract, and rotate the probe. And then the omniplane angles go you know, 0 to 180. But again, like uh, that's why uh, TE is actually easier to use. But again, you need to have a fairly solid balance of uh, skills uh, from transthoracic in order to be able to interpret the stuff that you see um, in TE. Uh, there's a greater range of questions that can be answered. So you can look for left atrial thrombus, uh, uh, aortic valve, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, um, endocarditis, aortic dissection, PFOs and ASDs, and procedural guidance can be guided by TE. 
and the diagnostic superior, uh, sorry, uh, accuracy is superior. So we know that the sense is best for Ts uh, greater than 90% for most indications. And this is actually coming from the uh, ASC as well as the American Heart Association guidelines and their data on you know, the accuracy and diagnostic superiority, superiority. This is not just from critical care. So again, T is scalable. Uh, we can use it for basic to advanced uh, focus uh, endpoints. Uh, uh, we can end with kind of more of the advanced critical error echo, and it can be done by transthoracic or TE. Uh, when the transthoracic views are inadequate, TE can maintain the standard of care. So even if you're only using it for your basic parasternal long, parasternal short, apical four, IVC view, you can still maintain that kind of thought pattern is like, I'm going to look at major things, RV function, LV function, RV size, pericardial fusion, IVC, and major left-sided regurgitant lesions. I can still maintain my standard of care even if I can't get transthoracic uh, windows. And But you can ramp up to 26 standard views and answer more complex questions as well. So again, this, this is kind of some of our standard views that we get. So just for showing up to the game, you get a soft view four-chamber view that's probably better than any four-chamber view you'll ever get from Apical. Uh, we have the bicable view here. Uh, we have the mid view, long axis view, and then we have the transgastric short axis view, which we'll go over in a second. So T, diff, uh, T's uh, have different users with different skill levels. Um, so you can imagine that somebody who's, uh, uh, you know, the Fast 10 movie is going to be coming up fairly soon. So you could just use it from getting from your house to the work and stuff like that. You drive in a straight line. Or you could be like these dudes over here who are trying to impress the girls. <laughs> uh, bust out the T and you can get all uh, uh, standard um, uh, 26 standard views and get their number and then, you know, head off into the sunset and stuff like that. So, um, so downsides to T, we've talked about this uh, in previous lectures, but I, I want to make sure that we, we address it here. So again, T is still physician centric uh, versus technology centric. So a physician actually has to show up to the bedside and actually do it. But actually, we would argue that's actually a good thing because what ends up happening is when te technologists grab you your images, they still have to go away, report it, have a sonographer overlook it, and then it gets pushed to the chart. So this physician at the bedside can interpret in real time. They can actually do, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, not, not just the interventions, but it's like you can clinically correlate in the no, moment, right? Like you can look at the screen, you'd be like, okay, I know what the vitals are. I can look at the end title. I can look at what the pressers are doing. And I'll be like, yeah, we definitely need to switch to epi now based on this EF. And we know the lactate's going up as opposed to waiting, you know, minutes to even like, I wouldn't even say it's minutes, probably hours to get a formal report on and then acting on that report a little bit later. Right. Um, unfortunately, there's still capital equipment costs. So we just recently got a few, a few more purposes, as I mentioned before, during our, um, during the pandemic. So we got pandemic pricing, but you know, most of these probes kind of cost somewhere between 30 grand and 50 grand, depending on the vendor. Uh, it's not necessarily minimally invasive, although they say that the uh, um, you know the esophageal rupture rate or the complication rate of T is kind of the one uh, one in every 50 to 60 thousand cases. And most of the time that um, you have uh, issues with T in the cardiology echo lab, it has to do with airway, right? So patients, you know, not fasted in the uh, aspirate or they get into troubles with sedation. So now, you, now you've caused them to have low blood pressure and stuff like that. Um, but in the ICU, we have, again, patients with central lines. So they're on vasopressors. We already have hopefully a stable airway. I think none of us, at least in the uh, ICU, uh, at least at the center, do they're any all Ts. Yeah. They're all intubated, right? So we don't do any procedurally guided Ts. We always do intubated Ts, right? Uh, the cleaning of the probe takes some time to kind of turn around, but we have a fairly good system to do that. And then again, the last big, big thing is probably it's politically charged at some centers where, you know, um, this whole thing about uh, you know cardiology or certain uh, subspecialties only being able to do TEs, I think that's becoming less and less these days. And especially because in the ASC as well as the American Heart, there are cardiologists as well as cardiac intensivists who actually do TE as well, and they've written position statements on these particular things where POCUS should be rolled out and and save you know like uh, kind of the more advanced questions like prosthetic valve endocarditis uh, or like very uh, advanced kind of like. Um, you know, ASD closures and things like that with an implant or should be done by, you know, cardiac anesthetist or, or cardiologist, right? I think the thing I just want to highlight too, uh, Vince, like from our standpoint, we can we can have a TE uh, from from the moment of thinking about it to doing it. Probably oh, within, like minutes. Like, well, you know, not even like, like, uh, like 30, 60 seconds. 
probably right. from the time to get it, you know, intubated into the esophagus yeah, and yeah. grabbing at least the first initial images. Yeah, yeah. like seconds, right? Like it's not you, long. Yeah. You might not be able to report the full thing no. and get like, you know, what what's going on with the lift atrial appendage sure. or what's happening in the descending thoracic aorta. But, you know, yeah. LV, RV function, IVC within yeah. seconds, right? Yeah. Just just like as if you were doing it for transfer right? Exactly. So, yeah, yeah exactly. basic quick right. shock yeah. assessment. And then if there's anything uh, more that has to be more advanced, then you take your time to be able to do that, assuming that, you know, the patient's not arrested and you have to, you know, uh, resuscitate them at the same time. So this is a photo of actually somebody in the room. So Derek Wu is actually, at this time, was a fourth year medical student at Western University. I think I was probably a critical care um, staff. Like I was like, a, um, yeah, I was just doing my, um, I had finished my POCUS fellowship. And then I was also doing kind of clinical scholar work. So I was doing my master's at McMaster and things like that. And I remember, uh, I wasn't here for this photo, but I heard about this photo and I heard about the scenario that Derek had been doing some rotations as a fourth year medical student. He was also interested in the ultrasound program. So I think he was a representative for the uh, medical student ultrasound thing. So you knew Rob Arnfeld, who was our mentor. And I think you were doing a trauma, like a trauma rotation or something, or you're doing an emerge rotation. So because Derek actually had some skills, you'll notice that this is actually, I believe, the trauma staff, right? And this is the trauma fellow or the trauma senior or whatever. Uh, but because they didn't have as much facility with actually doing the uh, the echo, you notice that, uh, you know, uh, Derek's gripping the probe really hard here because like he's probably a bit nervous, but he was actually getting the fast exam, right? Like, so he was looking in the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant. He was looking down in the pelvis and he's looking for fluid fluid. And then I think, I, I, I can't remember the end part of the scenario, but I just heard that your fast actually got the patient to the OR because he found free fluid or something like that. And they got open, the patient survived. And, you know, so again, because um, this is one of those things, again, back to the disruption, there are people who are trying to learn this skill at an earlier and earlier level now. So for example, Brian and I sometimes go over to the medical school and we teach the medical students how to, you know, be able to uh, get basic, uh, you know, um, ultrasound skills. So there are times sometimes where uh, the most, uh, you know, experienced person in the room might be somebody who's below your level of training in terms of R or, you know, fellowship or staff and things like that. But I would have to say that uh, Brian's actually very unique here in this sense is that he's one of the only faculty in all of Canada who's training other faculty right now. So there will be a time where hopefully most of the faculty, either as you know, their, uh, you know further adoption or further training by uh, people like Brian, or down the road that you guys all become staff and you guys are now kind of percolating into those levels that everybody will be actually facile with ultrasound. And then mm -hmm. this whole thing about like, you know, uh, oh, we have to wait for, you know, like the, the staff cardiologist, the staff radiologist to read this. It's like, no, you can make a call in the middle of the night that might save a person's life and you don't have to ask for that autopsy the next day, right? So. So for anybody who's interested in actually learning this stuff, um, you know, uh, I'm a big proponent of not reinventing the wheel. If somebody's already done this already. I usually just send them to those resources. So the uh, perioperative, uh, perioperative intraoperative echo website at U Toronto is basically where I learned a lot of this, kind of the standard views and things like that. And there's a, a simulator that's part of it for you to be able to insert. Like, obviously, you won't have a probe in your hand. You just have your mouse and you kind of like insert and uh, retract and then rotate the probe. But you can learn all the standard views. You can do virtual TE and stuff like that. There's an iPad app too that's uh, that's really really good for keeping. Right. Yeah. It's the same same group. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is basically one of the probes that hooks up to uh, one of the uh, in in this case probably one of the exports or one of the Sonosite machines. But you know most probes are very similar to this or you know look look something like this. And the idea is that um, we want to kind of like give you a little bit of an intro to TE such that if you do become a critical care fellow in our program, we do the critical care fellowship and, and ultrasound. Um, this is what we expect you guys to know. And then you can start with the basic views and you can add up to, you know, 20 to 26 uh, kind of the standard views. So remember in terms of TE setup, you want to pre-screen all the uh, patients for an actual indication. So, you know, hemodynamic instability, if you're looking for, you know, like a PFO or an ASD, like a right to left shunt and things like that, that might be a good thing for TE. Infective endocarditis, um, uh, patients who have you know procedural guidance and things like that that you might need for like BB ECMO. We'll go over some examples of that. Uh, make sure that they don't have any uh, gastroesophageal contraindications at all. So make sure that they haven't had a gastric pull up. They've had resections. They have active cancer there. They're having an active GI bleed, esophageal varices. All those things you want to make sure that they don't have because you don't want to make uh, you know a blind uh, insertion uh, to make that particular uh, situation worse. 
you want to make sure that your personnel in the room, um, or at least who are looking after the patient, know that you're doing the TE. So you have to make sure that if they're on a, a pressure support ventilation, that the RTs have to switch them back to an AC mode or a backup rate, because chances are you'll be giving a paralytic or extra sedation that they might not breathe. And tell the bedside nurse to stop the feeds and things like that. Uh, the other equipment that you might need is bite block. Again, if you paralyze the patient, you might not need that. You might just be able to um, have the probe down, especially in the arrested patient. You might not have time to wait for the bite block. And then obviously the probe and uh, the machine and then the drugs we just mentioned. So I'm not sure where this came from. I'm just going to give it to our mentor, Rob Arnfeld, as like he started a, kind of with the basic four views. And the basic four views, remember, are surrogates for things that you would do in transthoracic. So again, the Midasoft Geo four chamber view, uh, that we get from TE is likened to the apical four chamber view we get from transthoracic. The midosophageal geo long axis view is the same as the parasternal long axis view that we get. Again, the images are flipped over, but you know the, uh, it's the same principles. Uh, the midosophageal geo bi cable likens kind of the uh, the subcostal IBC view, and the transgastric short axis view is like the parasternal short axis view. So again, as you insert the probe. Just for showing up, just putting into the mid-esophagus, you put the omniplane at zero angle, the probe head, you don't have to do anything with, because again, you're in the esophagus, you don't want to uh, you know, tilt the probe head at all. And in terms of rotation, you just have everything kind of centered in the LV. You'll get your best uh, mid-esophageal uh, four-chamber view that you've ever gotten. To get from mid-esophageal four-chamber to long axis, all you have to do, the only change to that one is 120 degrees. So you increase that, and then you get basically your left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, LVOT, uh, aortic valve, as well as your um, uh, aorta. And you can always go back to your mid-esophageal four-chamber, and you just minus it back uh, 120. In order to get your bicable, you put it to 90 degrees, and you rotate to the right. So the thing that I always teach all of our learners is that if you're holding the TE probe, if you're rotating right, so therefore a clockwise turn in your hand, you're going to look at right-handed structures. So things that are on the right side are the cava, right? So the IBC, SVC are going to be on the right-hand side. You're going to look more at R RV uh, in that case if you turn to the right. If you want to look at left-sided structures, uh, turn back towards the LV, do a left-hand turn, so a counterclockwise turn in your hand. And if you want to look even more extreme to the LV, things that kind of unfold on the left-hand side of the body are the descending thoracic aorta. So you can look for dissections and things like that in that area if you turn further left. And then finally, uh, the transgastric. So again, a little bit different than the mesophageal. You have to insert to the transgastric. You put it back to zero degrees. So again, no change from mesophageal. And then you antiflex basically, basically um, uh, back towards the apex uh, or to the, uh, sorry, to the, uh, the mid paps. And you're basically trying to get a short axis view from that. So again, this is the mesophageal four chamber view. Again, omniplane angle is at zero. You just plop this into the mesophagus and then you get basically your, your, your four chamber view. So uh, a little bit different than um, uh, your uh, apical four because the apical four will look like this, right? It'll be like basically flipped around and then LV would be here, RV would be here and then left atrium, right atrium. So this is exactly opposite because we're looking from inside the esophagus. So we're looking from behind the heart. So everything's flipped around. So this is LV, LA, RA, RV. So mitral valve and then tricuspid valve. The midosophageal long axis view. So this is a little bit zoomed and I apologize, but uh, this is basically your parasternal long axis view. So again, in your parasternal long axis, you'll see the left atrium mitral valve, left ventricle. You'll see the aortic valve here. You'll see the RVOT. So this would be kind of rotated as, as if it was like this. And then the LV would be over like this. And then the RVOT would be up here. Left atrium would be here. Uh, so this is the, uh, uh, the uh, LVOT, this aortic valve and the uh, ascending aorta. Uh, next view is the bicable view. So in the um, subcostal view, IBC, you only see the IBC and you'll see a whole bunch of liver tissue sitting over here. So we can actually get that when we insert the probe even a little bit more and we go into the gastric. So we can look for the liver and basically the IBC view. But in this one, we actually get the SVC view. And then the more, the more important thing that uh, we can also look at is the intraatrial septum. So we can look for PFOs, ASDs here between the left atrium and right atrium. The other thing we can do um, is we can uh, predict the directionality of a PFO ASD. So for example, the left atrium looks like it's bowing into the right atrium here. So therefore the pressure here is going to be higher. So any holes in this particular chamber will actually probably go left to right, not right to left, right? So if this was bowing, like if the intraatrial septum was bowed this way instead, we'd predict the right atrial pressure is going to be higher than left atrial pressure. And therefore there's going to be a right to left shunt. And then finally, the transgastric short axis. So again, very much like into your parasternal um, uh, short, short axis view, and we get this basically by inserting the probe down into the uh, gastric, um, into, the, into the stomach, and then basically antiflexing the head of the probe. 
So again, like this is our roadmap. We always start in misophagy just by inserting the probe in the We can go 120 to the omniplane to get your long axis, go back to zero, go to 90 and then turn rightward uh, to look for the bicable, go back to zero again and turn leftward to get back to the um, uh, metasophageal four chamber and then insert down to transgastric short axis and uh, go back to zero degrees by antiflex the big wheel. So the rest of the time, we're just gonna have a look at some examples. So this is actually not one of the standard views. This is uh, otherwise known as the deep transgastric five chamber view, but this is very similar to the uh, apical five chamber view that you'd actually get from uh, transthoracic, right? So, uh, uh, so what we do basically is we insert, instead of being just in the stomach a little bit, we actually go very deep into the transgastric. And then when we antiflex the, the neck of the probe, we antiflex a whole lot more and we basically end up where the probe head sits right at the apex, just as you were if you were doing an apical five chamber. And the whole idea is that, so just to orientate everybody, so this is the left ventricle here, right ventricle here, this is the right atrium, this is the left atrium. But instead of having a nice opened up uh, uh, left atrium, it's actually kind of a little bit fore uh, foreshortened. And the reason why that is, is that we're actually getting the LVOT here, right? We have the aortic valve here, and we have the ascending aorta here. So, for example, if you're looking for stenosis, you're looking for ejection, uh, you know, like uh, your VTI and stuff like that from your LVOT, you can actually get it from your TEE just as, just as well as you could get it from your transthoracic, right? Uh, but what's uh, foreshortened here is the left atrium, as you see here, and the mitral valves here, right? And we can look for, you know, flow acceleration, we look for AI and stuff like that, and we look for um, anything that uh, we're concerned about, just like as if you were going to do it in, um, in transthoracic. Uh, so this is a case of uh, actually at this center. So this was done on a weekend, I believe, over in neuro ICU. So this patient came in with a you know, left-sided MCA stroke or whatever, and they were outside the window for TPA, but thank goodness they didn't get TPA because the patient later had a fever. And the question the neurointensivist had for us was whether or not this was endocarditis. So um, as you can see here, this is the mid-esophageal long axis view. So left atrium here, mitral valve here, left ventricle. This is the aortic valve. You have the sending aorta here. And as you can see by this red circle sign that there's something going on with this particular valve, it shouldn't ever be this thickened. And uh, what ended up happening as well is that later that day, I believe the intensivist told me that the patient was growing MSSA in their, in their, on their valves and stuff like that. So um, the left MCA stroke was quite bad and there was hemorrhagic transformation as well. And it's, it sounded like the patient was of an age uh, and also of goals of care that didn't want to, you know, undergo like, uh, you know, have a big stroke and stuff like that, then they have to go undergo like open heart surgery to kind of replace the valve and things like that. So I think the end result of this was uh, the patient uh, got withdrawn on, I believe on Saturday and it was a long weekend. So like we could have waited for the formal diagnosis on a Tuesday, right? And we could probably even get this diagnosis from a transthoracic echo, but we actually were able to expedite care and actually get the answers to the family that they wanted to figure out why this all happened, right? You know, positive blood cultures, you know, left MCA stroke, you know, kind of uh, fits the fits the category of what was going on. And the other thing too, is we can, uh, you know, look for super AI. So just from a teaching standpoint, for those of you who are, uh, you know, interested in, in echo and stuff like that, anytime that you see kind of backwards flow during diastole, and it takes up greater than 65% of the LVOT, that is indicative of severe AI. Severe MR, uh, on the other hand, uh, if this patient had MR, if the regurgitant jet took up 40% of the left atrium, then that would be considered severe MR. So there's different cutoffs for the different severities of all the different, um, uh, for the different valves in terms of uh, regurgitation. So um, I'm glad the light house lights are down because it wasn't showing up that well from before. Uh, but what you can see here is that, I, I mean, at the top of the screen, like all the uh, diagnoses are there, unfortunately, but uh, basically what you can see here is that there's poor uh, LV function uh, in this particular um, uh, patient. Uh, this is uh, a uh, mid-esophageal two-chamber view, so it's generally gotten at 90 degrees, but um, uh, you know, it was gotten at 74 for, for this particular patient. But the nice thing about the two-chamber view is that you can actually have a look at the left atrial appendage. So that's this, um, you know, uh, serpiginous thing that kind of outpouches from the left atrium. And what you'll notice is that in the left atrium itself, the other thing is that there's no ECG leads here for this particular patient. Maybe it wasn't working that day, but this patient was in FIB. 
right? So what do you think that it's happening here is probably that, uh, you know, there's a left atrial clot there. And then sometimes what we can see is not even just a form clot where it kind of like, um, you know, looks a little bit like gelatinous like this. Uh, we can actually see smoke, which is also known as spontaneous echo contrast, where you just see a whole bunch of like echogenicity, which, uh, uh, which sh shouldn't be there. Uh, most of the blood in the heart should be black, right? So the reason why, so the other thing is that uh, some people always ask is like, oh, is this just an overgained image? Have we turned the, like, the gain up so high that everything's just bright? Well, that's not necessarily the case because as you notice here, the left ventricle itself is still quite dark, right? And this area above the, you know, the, whatever this gelatinous thing is, is also still quite dark. So this is, if we saw that everything was bright here and everything was bright in the left ventricle, then that might be an overgain issue. But I would say that this is, uh, you know, echogenic in relation to all the anechoic stuff that's still already there. So I don't think this is necessarily a gain issue. This is probably an actual lesion issue with, uh, with the clot. So, um, we did a study during COVID called the COVID shunt study. And so uh, one of the um, hypotheses was that uh, the patients with COVID were having uh, kind of pulmonary vasodilation. And the reason why they were hypoxic and kind of happy hypoxic and things like that is that they got used to kind of their hypoxemia from intrapulmonary shunts, whereby actually there was right to left shunting where, you know, red blood cells, instead of going through the heart uh, uh, into the lungs and getting reoxygenated, they would actually bypass and then just uh, make it back to left ventricle. And that's why they were hypoxic. So that was a good theory. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't completely borne out in the data that we found, but we did find some patients that had an intrapulmonary shunt. So this is a TE. Again, we're doing uh, basically ECG gating. Obviously, the ECG is not working very well. It says 73 beats per minute. We can't see the QRS complexes. But basically, what we do is we do a bubble study where we do agitated saline through a 3A stopcock. We inject, uh, basically waiting for at least one cardiac cycle where we don't see anything on the right-hand side. Normally, bubbles that are going to come, as you can see here, will opacify the right-hand side. That's normal, but you should never see bubbles on the left-hand side. So normally in the pulmonary uh, circulation, bubbles are actually filtered out unless you have an intracardiac shunt or you have an intrapulmonary shunt. Intrapulmonary shunts are usually found between four to eight cardiac cycles after injection. So again, you need to count one cardiac cycle where there's nothing on the uh, right-hand side of the heart. Then you count one, two, three, four. So it starts starting up around three or four. That's more indicative of an intrapulmonary shunt versus an intracardiac shunt, which I'll show you guys in just a second. It usually crosses within one to two cardiac cycles. Mm -hmm. So as you can see here, so uh, this was like basically a bubble study on a patient who has like having refractory hypoxemia, didn't know what was going on. And the idea was that they were already on nitric oxide and it wasn't really helping the situation. And the peeps were low and they, they found that as they lowered the peeps, things got better. And the reason why that is, is that you didn't want the peeps to actually increase uh, RV afterload and therefore shunt more across the uh, intra intra substance. So this patient has a PFO or an ASD. And you'll notice that again, one cardiac cycle, two cardiac cycles is already coming over and it's basically opacifying the left side of the heart and that's not supposed to happen, right? So. Uh, this was a case actually of, I believe, Drew Thompson. He was an eMERGE doc uh, in London. And basically, this was an uh, 87-year-old female, and she basically had, you know, new onset chest pain and started migrating down her back. And she rested once already with EMS, so she was intubated already. So, uh, but after her rest, she was actually awake, right? And what ended up happening is that she had a creatinine of like 200 and you know, uh, she had goals of care that previously suggested that she wouldn't want to have, you know, like dialysis and things like that, because she was like a CKD patient who was 87, but she didn't want to be on dialysis. So Drew said, well, um, I know the formal diagnosis for what I'm thinking is happening as aortic section would be to do a CT scan uh, with contrast. But instead, he decided to drop the probe down. So the patient was awake, he resedated her and was able to get the probe down. And you'll notice that this is your midosophageal long axis views. This is your left atrium here, the mitral valves hanging over here, the LVs over here. Uh, but you notice that the function is not that great anyways for what's wiggling. But in addition to that, you see the aortic valve is still opening, you know, okay. Uh, but the major thing that you see in the ascending uh, aorta is that you see this flap that's here, right? That flap's not supposed to be there. So that was the concern for aortic dissection. And the other thing too is that um, what ended up happening was uh, he puts color basically on the descending thoracic aorta. So again, to get this view, you're basically at either zero or 90 degrees. And then what you do is you do a left-hand turn. So you're going to look at left side of structures within the chest. You see the th descending thoracic aorta and he puts a color probe on. So if you guys had to guess, which is the true lumen and this, which is the false lumen, what do you guys think of that aortic flap? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
So generally the, the, the colored section, because there's still flow within that, and again, we dropped the Nyquist down all the way to 20. So it's still low flow, but there's flow in this particular lumen and not in this lumen, right? So this is thought to be the false lumen. This is the true lumen. And this might be important for a cardiac surgeon who's thinking about cannulating the patient. You want to make sure you don't cannulate the wrong lumen, right? Especially if they're dissected all the way down to their groin. The end result of this particular case is that she was 87 years old. After she woke up from her TE sedation, she is actually able to nod to the eMERGE doc. Yeah, she doesn't want to have anything. She just wants to be palliated because like she's going to die of this particular lesion without any surgery, but she didn't want any surgery. So the family came in. We admitted her to ICU. The family were able to say their goodbyes and we actually palliated her right then and there. Again, we didn't have to go for a CT scan, knock out her kidneys and things like that. Not that she would sign up for dialysis anyways, right? But you get the idea, right? So we were able to get the information from, from just uh, doing the TE. Uh, so this is a case of a patient who was, I think, 18 years old. He was fairly young and he had uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. You can notice that uh, in terms of like uh, the rule of thirds for kind of uh, right, uh, right ventricle outflow tract to aorta to left atrium, the left atrium is quite large here and the left ventricle is quite large as well in comparison to everything else. So this is a very dilated and, and you'll notice that the EF is quite low. It's kind of like the 20 to 25% range. And the patient was basically constantly in shock and constantly in heart failure, always getting into, you know, pulmonary edema and stuff like that. And so what ended up happening was uh, the, the thought was that this particular young patient uh, who had a, a difficult match in terms of uh, heart transplant, um, you know, I, I think he was like a, um, uh, an O negative or an O positive, I can't remember, uh, blood type. So he would have had to wait a long time, but he was still in heart failure right in front of our eyes. So the idea was that he was going to get an LVAD basically for insertion. Um, and we know that this uh, LV was actually cr uh, chronically dilated and chronically low because the left atrium has ballooned up and actually gotten larger over time. Uh, and so we can tell the chronicity. Um, oftentimes we use the left atrium as a, um, Brian's favorite term is the canary in the coal mine. It's like if it's dilated for, uh, it's been dilated, it means that whatever was happening for the left side of the disease has been happening for quite a while. So prior, so this is prior to LVAD insertion. So the LVAD actually gets inserted. So the LVAD also has to be eventually anticoagulated, right? Because now you have this foreign body that blood is basically being siphoned through and things like that. So I was looking after this patient in cardiac ICU afterwards. And uh, we basically put the TE probe down because there was some concerns that within the LVAD itself in the circuit, they could tell that, um, uh, or not in the circuit, but there was concerns that maybe this patient was actually uh, not properly anticoagulated. So he was on uh, full heparin drip, his, uh, I, uh, his PTT was therapeutic, but what we did is when we threw this down, uh, you'll notice that again, uh, sorry, just trying to get my mouse here. So uh, this, uh, just to orientate you guys, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, this is the left atrium, this is the right atrium. So what you'll notice is that again, is this a gain issue? It could be, but you'll notice that this area is darker, this area is dark, the left atrium, right ventricle, and the uh, right atrium are darker still in comparison to the smoke that you can kind of see that's happening in the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening was we actually found out later that this patient had heparin resistance. So like, despite the fact that PTTs were uh, up, that the patient was still forming clot. So I think we eventually put this patient on or gachaban or something else. And eventually the smoke kind of went away. Um, we turned the flows up on the LVAD as well to like six liters and things like that. And that uh, helped as well. But this was actually still done on like five liters. So again, the patient was still kind of pro-thrombotic, uh, probably because of the, the foreign body that was happening in this particular patient. So again, like useful information for us to gather, just, you could, just because the, the LVAD flows weren't going very well, because we were worried that maybe the, the, the system itself was being clotted. And then uh, kind of back to uh, the resuscitative scenario. So as you can see here, that CPR is ongoing for this particular patient. So this patient was like a 40-year-old person who uh, uses um, uh, cocaine and, and fentanyl and stuff like that, but never injected that, um, just kind of primarily smoked it, but was found down in the, you know, the downtown of London, Ontario, and was brought to Universal Hospital. So what ended up happening was the patient's obviously arrest was ongoing. The EMS was still doing CPR when they rolled the patient in, but he was already intubated in the field. And the uh, eMERGE doc, Frank Mislick, actually ended up putting a probe down. And what you'll notice here is that um, you have basically a whole bunch of resuscitative fluid that's going in on the right side and, and, and things like that. So you can't really uh, see the left side, uh, right side very well, but you see the left side. Uh, so this is the left ventricle. This is left atrium. This is the mitral valve. But you see this thing kind of 
you know, around inside the um, inside the left atrium. So is this an endocarditis on the left uh, left sided mitral valve? Or what we actually ended up finding is that this was because the patient was found down, he was actually arrested for a longer period of time, like at least, you know, probably at least an hour. And then when EMS arrived and they started doing CPR, they were able to break up the clot a little bit. But what ended up happening was that um, as the as you arrest, basically, and as flows become less in the heart, you'll eventually form intracardiac thrombus. And that's part of the natural phenomenon and natural consequence of basically uh, patients arresting. Uh, so they gave this patient TPA. It didn't work because the patient had already been arrested for an hour uh, plus, like an hour plus of like CPR. So ROSC hadn't even been achieved yet and the CPR was going on for an hour, but then he was found down before that. So he couldn't have been also, you know, arrested for hours even before that as well. And then, um, and then people were blown. So they eventually called it after about an hour. Uh, he was a little bit hypothermic, which is why they had to keep going for, for the time. And then this is another example of, again, intracardiac thrombus. So uh, what you'll see here is cardiac stance. So, so this TE probe was put down after. So this is during a pulse check for a patient uh, in ICU. And what you'll notice is that uh, this patient's been arrested for a while because what ends up happening is then you see, start seeing that smoke and you start seeing that smoke everywhere. So could this have been an overgain issue? Yeah, it definitely could. And you'd wonder if whether or not you just overgain this. But the other very concerning thing about this is that the heart's not moving very well at all. Like you can kind of see maybe the, you know, the annulus of the valve is moving a little bit. Uh, but basically, this is cardiac stand. So, and this is a poor prognostic sign. So, we've done a, a study called the PREDICT study in London, whereby if patients have cardiac stand, so plus they have uh, signs of intracardiac thrombus or, you know, smoke, that uh, the mortality basically is 100%. And so, this can also be used for procedural guidance. Um, so, this is an example of a, uh, so you guys have heard of TABIs before, right? So, trans uh, uh, aortic uh, valve implantation. So this particular patient has a pulmonary stenosis. So this is the aortic valve here, just to orientate you. This is the intraarterial septum. This is all the right-sided structures. And as you come up here, this is the RVOT. This is the pulmonic valve. And you notice that there's cal uh, calcifications on it. And uh, this is the pulmonary artery. What ended up happening was, uh, instead of doing a TAVI, they decided to do a TPVI, so a transpulmonary uh, valve implantation. This was done in London. And the, the surgeon who did this is basically a TAVI expert. So he said, oh, you know, like this uh, pulmonic stenosis instead of, uh, the, the other thing about this patient was an adult congenital patient who had a lot of pulmonic uh, stenosis from before. Um, and so had multiple kind of uh, redo operations. So they didn't want to do a redo sternotomy because it would take forever to get in there. So there'd be a lot of, you know, like um, uh, adhesions and things like that and worried about bleeding. So they decided to do this TPVI. What ended up happening was they balloon dilated up the uh, pulmonic valve, and then they tried to insert the TAVI valve in the pulmonic position. Well, you'll notice here that the pulmonary artery is quite large. So anything over three centimeters is quite large. So there's already three and a half centimeters, I believe, when we measured it. And what ended up happening is when they ballooned up open this, uh, this valve, it actually migrated. So this is us following. So you can see the valve here. And then over here, as it goes in the main PA, it can go over to the right side. So what ended up happening is we followed this PA into the right side, and this is the valve that's sitting here. So uh, let me see if we actually put color across it. So what ended up happening is the patient actually didn't arrest, like nothing really happened. This is just like the valve was in the wrong place. So the patient actually ended up getting a sternotomy anyways to fish out the old valve and still replace the uh, pulmonic stenotic valve as well. So... So again, things that we can do with uh, with uh, with guidance. The other thing that we can do is that we can uh, uh, do uh, VV ECMO insertion. So as you can see here, oh, let me go back to the beginning part of this bit. So again, this is the left atrium, right uh, uh, right atrium. This is the SVC. So you see a wire going down. The wire is now going down to the IVC, and then uh, over the top of that wire, there's double dilation of that cannula. And then the cannula is inserted over the wire. So just like any other big cell danger technique, but this is one of the Avalon catheters that we can insert for VV ECMO. Um, they do uh, Avalon's less now. They kind of just do the right IG approach as right FEM approach. But this is uh, like a one stage or a two stage cannula. And this cannula sits here basically in the right atrium. And then the basket basically is aimed down towards the tricuspid valve. Um, oh, and like this, right? So we put the color box on and basically it's hooked up now to uh, VA, uh, sorry, VV ECMO. And basically uh, you can notice that the, uh, the flow is uh, going appropriately down into the right ventricle. So you basically take deoxygenated blood from the right-hand side 
have it go through the ECMO system, get it reinserted back into the right-hand side through this cannula, and basically it shoots out into the right ventricle and you can basically oxygenate the whole system that way. So we just wanted to thank the University Hospital Foundation, the Royal Alec Hospital Foundation, the Common Foundation, because they gave us funding during COVID to actually basically do the COVID shunt study. And now we have three probes, as mentioned before here at the university, one probe at the Alec, one probe at the nuns, and then we're hopefully gonna get probes at the Ms as well as the, um, as well as the uh, sturgeon at some point. So there will be TE capabilities uh, throughout the Edmonton zone, hopefully. And then we've trained up, uh, you know, Leon Biker, uh, Andrew Robinson, as well as uh, Laz Milovanovic. They're our former kind of POCUS fellows. Um, so hopefully we'll have TU capabilities uh, across the, uh, the zone and uh, have people who are trained enough to do it. And uh, there's been a lot of collaboration specifically at the Great Nun site between like Leon Biker as well as the cardiologist there. So even if the images are required by one particular subspecialty, we run some of the images by the other subspecialty such that we get the best diagnosis and the best information as possible before we have to transfer the patient to the Mazankowski or, or whatever at the Heart Institute. So one other big plug I would say is that, um, so POCUS is one of those things, just like any skill within medicine, that if you're gonna do it, you're gonna, you should do it right. So even if you do an ultrasound, you know, elective or stuff like that, or one month or two months, that might not be enough for you to get, you know, all the things that you need. So uh, this is a big plug basically for the fellowship. I would think that um, the fellowship that we have uh, is very uh, similar to the one done in London. And Dr. Buchanan has been able to tra uh, train up at least four or five fellows within our program. Uh, and they all have staff jobs and things like that. So it's it's definitely a good skill set to have, and it's something that's marketable for 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 your future careers and things. So in conclusion, uh, this is from Moneyball. This is about Brad Pitt, adapt or die. So uh, in the context of that particular movie, was that you know the Oakland Athletics had to figure out a way to win, still uh, even though they had lower budgets and things like that. I think that uh, in the world right now where uh, it's very difficult sometimes to always get an answer right away. Sometimes you have to wait till the Tuesday after a long weekend, or you have to wait for, you know, the formal uh, diagnosis that, um, but some patients can't wait, right? Some patients can survive that long to actually wait for the formal diagnosis, but sometimes they can. So get, getting a POCUS diagnosis, uh, especially if you're trained and you have, you know, the skill set to be able to do it, the diagnosis can be done faster and it would be just as good as if you waited till Tuesday, right? So Thanks very much for your time, guys, and all the best.